Hello everyone. Uh, today we are starting our third executive model OIC co simulation conference and we are firstly proceeding with online lectures. It is our first week and due to the COVID-19 pandemic, we will deliver our simulation conference and lectures online through live stream in our Facebook page. So welcome all of you. My name is Shujad Ahmed Sadeh and I will be a moderator today. Uh, today, our first guest will be Elmaddin Mehdiev, Director General of the ICYF ERC. And he will deliver a lecture about the uh, ongoing political uh, situation and about organization with cooperation. And firstly, I'd like to inform you about uh, our program as well. Our program will consist of five five week lectures, online lectures of the ambassadors and the experts in this field. And afterwards, 60 most successful participants will receive an honor to participate at online simulation conference will be organized by the ICYF ERC. And the very exciting part of that, that the winners who will be very successful participants, they will have a chance to go to the Kazan to participate at the International Model OIC Eurasia will be organized by the ICYF ERC, most probably in the fall. So without taking too much time, I'd like to give floor to the Mr. Elmaddin Mehdiev to deliver his speech. Welcome, Mr. Mehdiev. Uh, hello, Shujaat. Hello, hello, Mr. Ahmadi Uh Just, uh, I'm testing here the voice. I think the things are fine there. You hear me? Yes, I do. Okay, okay. Thank you very much. Uh, just, I will request one uh, minute more uh, in order to finalize here my notes, and I will start uh, exactly at 5 p.m. Sure. In this time, I'd like to remind the, to the participants at least to put a reaction to this video in order to help us to check their attendance during the live stream, which will be counted at the end in order to rate their success and gave them a successful participation certificates. Thank you in advance. And please, if you are joined, please put any reaction or any comment. And after the lecture, we will have a few minutes uh, to receive some questions. And Mr. Mehdiev will answer your questions, which you can write below in the comment section. Thank you in advance, dear the participants. And uh, also, uh, I'd like to remind you that the duration of the live stream will be approximately one hour, 45 minutes for the lecture and uh, 50 minutes for the Q&A session. Okay, so may I start? Yes, you can. you can. Okay, thank you very much. So, hello everybody. Uh, as my colleague Shujaat mentioned, uh, I am the first speaker of the uh, Executive Model OIC online lectures. And I would like to greet you all uh, in the third executive model OIC online lectures. Uh, today, my subject uh, of uh, presentation is about the role of international organizations in regional cooperation and uh, sustainable development. And uh, as my colleague Shujaat informed, uh, we, due to the uh, ongoing uh, pandemic situation in the world, including in our countries, in, in the countries of each, uh, each one, uh, 
we uh, in the ERC, in the Eurasian Regional Center, decided to switch our programs and projects online, so not to lose time, and also to provide with the opportunities our uh, youth from the region uh, to uh, participate in these projects. Uh, and uh, that's why we started this uh, uh, Eurasian model, uh, actually the third executive model OIC online. So uh, the project, as Shuja had mentioned, will include uh, five uh, weeks, uh, two uh, lectures in each week, in total 10 weeks. And at the end, in June, we will have the model OIC simulations. So uh, talking about the international organizations, I would like to give you some uh, introduction to this uh, uh, phenomenon, uh, phenomenon of international organizations. And uh, we will talk today about the classification and history of the international organizations and also the specific role they are playing in international relations and also uh, the cooperation among the states, in particular the uh, regional cooperation. The explorations on international organizations and regional cooperation are not a new phenomenon in, uh, uh, in international politics. Uh, many scholars consider international organizations as central units of politics and uh, globalization. For instance, it's challenging, challenging to discuss sovereignty of a nation without mentioning the United Nations. Their roles involve not punishing or imposing sanctions on member states, but ensuring compliance with mutuality, mutually agreed uh, upon standards and rules. It does not entail going against the sovereignty of any country. A classical example uh, includes the Un United Nations, whose role involves negotiating the implementation and respecting of set agreements ranging from economic, political conflict, social and humanitarian issues, like climate change, refugees and terrorism. Such issues need multilateral or bilateral approaches among the international organizations and its representatives from every member state. Such organizations provide platforms for continuous dialogue or regulatory matters and facilitate the com comparability of approaches. Also, international organizations uh, develop international policy and uh, international policy and legal instruments including contributing the creation of mutual regulatory language and standards. Num numerous scholars have discussed on the effectiveness of international organizations. Pract practitioners have explored their impacts on environment, diplomacy, justice, peace, and stability, as well as policy formulation, of course. Nonetheless, it's not still much clear the exact way in which activities of international organizations impact on regional cooperation exactly. Besides these organizations existing for numerous decades, discussions about them lack unifying definition, including what are their specific roles in the majority of academic uh, work of international politics, international organizations and regional cooperation, scholars seem to hold varying opinions concerning the exact functions uh, of international system in state of regional actions. For instance, there are divided views concerning whether the international institutions influence regional policy making, I mean the state and foreign policies, 
Scholarly, scholarly work from real school of thought imply that international institutions don't affect regional policies, since states and regional organizations are too protective and uh, don't want to give away power to an external supranational organization in order to shape, enforce, and influence policy settings. Contrarily, the liberal institutional, institutionalists claim that international organizations uh, can impact on policy making due to the efficiency established by information sharing and the ability to minimize transactional cost, increasing the cost of non-compliance. Also, it remains to be uh, on uh, it remains to be answered about whose interests the international organizations serve at state and regional levels. Some claim the international system has led to erosion of uh, political, economic, and social spaces in various nations and regions, uh, while others indicate the advance uh, imperialistic policies of their uh, originating countries. Moreover, despite of general consensus regarding uh, the role of regional uh, entities in facilitating cooperation, uh, there are remains uh, concerns regarding the effectiveness of international organizations in enabling cooperation. Also, it is not still clear the exact way in which activities of international organizations uh, impact on regional cooperation, as I stated uh, a while ago. For this purpose, we have to examine the history and classification of international organizations. International organizations have expanded in number, influence, and range of activities they are engaged in. Historically, international organizations uh, have been established for various reasons. They are perceived as important actors in international politics, including uh, dispute uh, resolution, mediation, uh, peacekeeping, provision of aid, dispute resolution, and others. Uh, the term of international organization was employed throughout the past decades to imply a wide range of phenomena. During the post-World post War Second era, it implied formal international uh, institutions or organizations which were part of part or organs in the United Nations. It's not surprising that during this era, these organizations were vastly studied as a manifestation of the international relations during the post-war. At this time, explorations were mostly descriptive in nature and concentrated on formal international legal agreements like Security Council treaties and the United Nations Charter. According to Bob Reynalda, uh, the international organizations are formal organizations that have continuous structures established by authority, authoritative instrument of uh, treaties among members, which can include two or more sovereign states. The members use these organizations to pursue common interests. In understanding the above mentioned definition, international organizations must have a formal as well as continuous frameworks implying uh, that they are stable with well-defined structures, including a headquarters, a formal set of standards or rules, uh, in an international secretariat, of course, with a responsibility to that organization, consultative organization meetings regularly during the plenary sessions and uh, decision-making procedures. Such definition differentiates international organizations from one-time conferences that seek to solve immediate problems or informal summit meetings like G20 or G8. By the way, 
uh, here I have to mention that uh, the second largest international organization in the world, the Organization of Islamic uh, Cooperation, uh, which was established in 1969. In the beginning or throughout the many years, it was also the kind of conference meeting. The first, actually, there, there was a, a conference of the uh, Organization of Islamic Conference uh, was established based on the first conference held uh, in Morocco in 1969. So uh, in order to provide the continuation of the work of that conference, it became the it became international organization with headquarters, but still uh, preserved the name uh, the, the word conference in its name until 2011. As you know, in 2011, the name of the organization was changed as Organization of Islamic Cooperation. So back to our. Uh, theoretical part of the presentation. Membership or the likelihood of joining international organizations is usually uh, characterized as being limited or global. The global international organizations involve those that which all countries are eligible to be members, while the limited membership are only open to countries that need a specific criteria of that specific international organization. Such criteria can be based on scientific, political, or economic aspects, but most importantly, geographic. The restricted entities can involve trans-regional and sometimes assume a regional structure. Nonetheless, the lack of uh, of a consistent definition of what make a region uh, implies that the definition of international organizations need to be treated with caution. The membership to most of the restricted international organizations stem from political, ideological, and histo historical affiliations. International organizations uh, are mainly divided into two types. Uh, inter uh, intergovernmental organizations, which we call IGOs, and uh, international non-governmental organizations, which we call INGOs. So this is the basic uh, classification of international organizations. One part is international governmental organizations, another part is international non-governmental organizations. The international governmental organizations are made up of mainly sovereign nations called the member states. Some of the examples of intergovernmental uh, organizations, international organizations include, of course, the best example is the United Nations and also, for example, international non-alignment movement or organization of Islamic cooperation, commonwealth of nations, and the League of Arab States, uh, among many others. In contrast, international non-governmental organizations involve non-profit organizations like Medicine Sans Frontiers and World Organizations of Scout Movement. In differentiating INGOs, non-governmental organizations from international organizations, uh, Signatories of, of the founding treaties, treaties need to, uh, to involve at least two sovereign nations. So in order to become the international uh, governmental organization, you need at least two member states, two sovereign nations. This does not imply that international organizations membership is limited to just nations. Several international organizations began as private entity and uh, countries later recognize the issues they address, propelling them to join them. Therefore, some international organizations are hybrid of countries and private actors. Uh, classification of the international organizations may depend on several factors, uh, geographical, structural, being political, economic, or military, or we call it defensive, thematic, and etc. 
So uh, this is very important part, uh, how to classify the international organizations. As we uh, mentioned uh, in the beginning, uh, they are divided into two parts, the governmental international organizations, intergovernmental international organizations, and non-governmental ones. But uh, depending on its nature, on its goal, or on its uh, field of activity, the type of classification may differ. So we can, uh, the international intergovernmental organizations, for example, uh, in geographical uh, sense, uh, we can classify it global ones, regional ones, so even sub-regional ones or let's say uh, depending on the field of activity or uh, we can uh, differentiate them like the political intergovernmental organizations economic intergovernmental international organizations or military intergovernmental uh, international organizations so it may differ uh, these uh, are uh, evolved gradually the nature of the international organizations and the scope of their activities. So that's why uh, I think that that will be very useful if we will uh, shortly examine the history of the international organizations, uh, the history also. Uh, there is a view that international institutions are a phenomenon of the 20th century. However, certain institutions were existed as early as the 19th century, especially in, the, in Europe. But uh, even the institutions existed in Europe in 19th century, even then they are not the first international organizations. So uh, many scholars, they consider that even the first peace treaty in the world, uh, we know, uh, the let's say first known peace treaty actually uh, this is the first uh, international organization or let's say the base uh, the primitive type of the international organization uh, one of those most significant uh, correspondences uh, was uh, beyond any doubt uh, the world known worldwide known uh, treaty of kadesh made between the Pharaoh uh, Ramses II and uh, Hattusili III, uh, heated king. Uh, it was in uh, 1269 uh, before Christ. Uh, so uh, following, and of course the following uh, treaties also, they established the primitive or simple basics of international organizations, which gradually evolved. And during the Middle, uh, middle Ages, uh, I mean, again, there was a pact or there were uh, treaties where just not just two or two or more, three, four uh, uh, entities or three, four states were part of that. Uh, so gradually it evolved. For example, we can give the example of the uh, 30 years after the uh, 30 years war uh, in 19, uh, in, uh, sorry, 1618, uh, 1648, the Westphalian Peace uh, Treaty was signed among the states that, that created kind of a set of rules for the parts of the uh, treaty. So we can call it also the basic or primitive uh, basics of the international organization. And of course, uh, when, then we can talk about the uh, concert of uh, Vienna. Vienna, uh, actually the, the peace treaty, Vienna peace uh, conference after the Napoleon Wars, uh, which uh, created the European concert. So, uh, the advancements and innovations linked with industri industrialism, plus to establishment of new uh, modes of communication as well as transport, are perceived to have uh, tri triggered the development of specific proposed international organizations, known as public unions in international scale with intention to facilitate 
cooperation of countries uh, in addressing uh, technical, political, social, and economic problems. Notably, uh, International Telegraphic Union, which was established in 1865, and Universal Postal Union, which was established in 1874, are among the first uh, international organizations that came into existence in modern understanding. These uh, unions survived uh, times of uh, survived times and the post World War I, World War II era became specialized organization of the United uh, Nations as the International Telecommunication Union, which we call it now. Within the, politic, within the political realms, efforts of uh, institutionalizing the dom, uh, dom, domineering role of the uh, superpowers in Europe began in 1815 and was carried out by the Congress of Vienna, uh, which I mentioned a while ago. Even though the resulting concert of Europe was not able to become a political organization, such pattern was functional up to the First World War as a framework utilized by great power uh, conference, making the Europeans, a European state seem to be uh, united. Such, concept, uh, such concept was widened by the uh, Hague Conference that took place in 1899 and 1907, uh, admitting small nations as well as big nations to take part in uh, collecting political negotiations and discussions. Emergence of several uh, inter-American uh, conferences in the late 19th century in particular uh, creation of Pan-American Union, was able to strengthen Monroe Doctrine. Furthermore, Simone Bolivar's uh, pronouncements that uh, expressed the ideology of nations of Western Hemisphere, uh, constituting of a, a distinct group in the larger multi-state. Multi -state. The 19th century offered to a large extent the foundation for the extraordinary instituting of international organizations. Since the First World War, uh, various uh, differences that emerged during this era between political and non-political ag agencies, superpowers and small states, and between geographical and uh, regionally undefined entities proved the importance in the later development of international organizations. They are basic structures and uh, procedure, procedure changed uh, and the trend of widening uh, them to include states beyond uh, Europe, be uh, widening them uh, to include states beyond Europe began and uh, notably the dual motivation of building uh, international organizations uh, emerged. The first one, the motivation to promote uh, cooperative responses to problems of peace between states in the period of growing uh, technical, economic, uh, political, and social uh, in, uh, interdependence. And the second motivation is, uh, Second motivation was the recognition of the importance of uh, regulating conflicts in military and political domains, uh, which became essential during this era, the uh, war between uh, two World War eras. After the World War I, uh, the emergence of League of Nations plus uh, associate institutions can be uh, considered as an important development towards collection of all features, principles, and aspects of organizational progress of that time in one international organization, of course, all of these aspects. It was the first international organization that had a permanent international secretariat which is a very important uh, characteristic of the international organizations. By the way, uh, we have to mention that uh, while class 
classifying the international intergovernmental organizations, uh, we can uh, classify them according to this uh, feature also. The most of the international intergovernmental organizations, they have their uh, permanent uh, secretariat or headquarters. But there are uh, though there are the ones which uh, they don't have this. For example, the uh, most famous one is the non-aligned movement, uh, which uh, unifies more than 100 uh, around 130 member states. Uh, this organization, this inter important intergovernmental organization, it it hasn't any headquarters or permanent secretariat, so which, which is very interesting. So uh, the first international intergovernmental organization which uh, had the permanent uh, secretariat was the League of Nations. It was the first international organization uh, with its permanent headquarters and had several purposes, uh, but its basic focus entailed political and security challenge of peace and war after the, the uh, First World War. The League of Nations was perceived as a global organization, even though it maintained focus on the centrality of Euro Europe in global affairs. Uh, after the World War II, the League of Nations was succeeded by the United Nations as a global organizational uh, obtained its main uh, features from the 19th and 20th centuries heritage, uh, as well as the negative and positive lessons of the League of Nations. It was developed as a central element of distinct and uh, decentralized systems of universal organizations that included uh, autonomous specialized entities following a public international union structure and organizations created by the uh, limited nations. The United Nations Charter uh, envisages uh, an intensive cooperation as well as coordination of uh, undertakings of the dedicated entities. We can call it its uh, subsidiary and specialized institutions by central organization uh, through its uh, social and economic council. Furthermore, uh, it uh, tried to control regional uh, entities by utilizing the security council. Uh, talking about the uh, international intergovernmental organizations uh, emerged after the uh, World War II, of course, there are numerous uh, examples uh, we can, uh, but the classic one, of course, it's the United Nations, as we mentioned, and also the subsidiary and uh, specialized institutions of the United Nations, uh, we, which are very important ones like United Nations Development Program, UNICEF, Food Organization, and many others. Uh, but meanwhile, there are another international organizations uh, emerged in the post uh, World War II era. Uh, we can, uh, among them, we can call the uh, Organization for Security and uh, Cooperation in Europe. Uh, we can uh, give as example uh, numerous organizations. Uh, for example, Pan-African Union, which is the geographical one, and also which is one of these organizations, which is very important to us, is the Organization of Islamic Cooperation, which was established in 1969. Uh, today, uh, OIC, the Organization of Islamic Cooperation, it has 59, uh, 57, I'm sorry, 57 uh, member states. Uh, one is suspended. Uh, and uh, from geographical aspect, uh, it covers uh, different geographies. Uh, it has member uh, states in, of course, in Africa, in Europe, uh, in Asia, uh, including Middle East, South Asia, Central Asia, Caucasus, and also the Far East. 
but also uh, which is very interesting the OIC has its members from uh, South America also so geographically it's very widespread international organization uh, and OIC uh, as a, in the example of the United Nations OIC also has its own uh, subsidiary specialized or affiliated institutions which uh, takes the role of uh, fulfillment of the vision and mission of the institution uh, uh, in different fields uh, and uh, sectors in different sectors uh, i think that uh, uh, the separate lecture should be devoted to the uh, organization of Islamic cooperation and its functionality and its uh, activities and roles in our uh, countries. So that's why just shortly I mentioned the OIC and also here uh, I would like to mention the role of the OIC in regional cooperation and uh, uh, contribution to the development of its member states. Uh, as I mentioned, there are different type of uh, subsidiary specialized and affiliated institutions of the OIC, which uh, implements the role of the uh, main goal of the uh, institution. And uh, these subsidiary institutions or specialized affiliated institutions, uh, they are they are uh, more visible uh, even it's like in the united nations example also it's like this these institutions with specific focus and specific goal they are more visible in uh, regional cooperation but of course all of them are under the umbrella institution umbrella organization and this is i mean uh, in fact uh, the mandate of their activity or mandate of their efficiency is uh, given by the main uh, institution, the main uh, umbrella institution. It's like uh, this in the United Nations, and it's like this in, in the uh, Organization of uh, Islamic Cooperation. By the way, uh, one of the, uh, uh, let's say, modern uh, institutions or intergovernmental organizations, successful organizations, we can give example the Turkic Council, and uh, the Turkic Council headquarters is based in Istanbul in Turkey. And then also it, it created its own uh, specialized or subsidiary uh, in, in institutions like uh, in, uh, in the field of culture, in the field of uh, heritage or uh, in the field of use. So, uh, uh, and uh, through these uh, subsidiary or specialized bodies, uh, the international intergovernmental organizations, they implement their role and mission. Uh, in conclusion, uh, I would like uh, to raise some challenge uh, in classification of the international organizations. Uh, first of all, uh, I see as a challenge uh, in theoretical uh, part, I mean, to, uh, classifying the international organizations, uh, how we should differ the unions uh, from international organizations or the unions can be, uh, can be considered as international organizations. For example, uh, the union of uh, Soviet socialist republics, uh, it uh, consisted of uh, 15 uh, socialist republics, uh, existed between 1922 and uh, 1991. And uh, of course, uh, these countries or republics uh, were united in, under the USSR forcibly. But I mean, uh, what was the classification of the USSR. I mean, it was the union, okay, but that was the state or that was the international organization. Uh, we call it union, but uh, at the same time, it uh, consists of the uh, sovereign uh, nations. 
So I think that this is the one of the challenges in classification, how we should classify the unions. Uh, we know that uh, international organizations, they are the one of the actors of international politics or international relations. And in some cases, these in, uh, actors, the international organizations, they say uh, the role of the sovereign states. So they act on behalf of the sovereign states. So maybe the example of USSR is uh, one of these uh, one of these uh, happenings that uh, when the union or the union of uh, several nations they undertake the role of the uh, sovereign states. Another example uh, which can uh, ideally fit is European Union. Uh, again, this is also union, but what's the European Union? It's the state or it's uh, international organization. Uh, we know that the history of the European Union, I mean, uh, it started with the uh, establishing the international organizations on especially on the economic field and industrial field, and then gradually evolved. And today we have the European Union, but uh, now it acts on behalf as a state, but at the same time, it, it uh, consists of the sovereign uh, states, uh, but who uh, bind it with some set of rules uh, in order to be the member of the EU. So uh, in my opinion, this is a theoretical challenge uh, in classification of the international organization. So there should be maybe, maybe there should be some uh, chapter or the classification for the unions because uh, the unions, they are not uh, full-fledged sovereign state yet, but at the same, not they are not federation. They are not uh, because some of the sovereign state, they are the politically, they are federations, but the unions, they are not federation. Uh, they are uh, con they are consisting of the independent states. So unions, it's kind of uh, in between the international organization and uh, sovereign state. Uh, so that's why uh, I think that it should be uh, uh, classified uh, accordingly. And uh, of course, there are too many uh, theoretical uh, let's say, articles about this, but uh, I think that uh, the specific uh, classification are not defined yet. And uh, another uh, challenge or let's say, uh, yeah, especially in terms of the regional cooperation, another challenge is uh, about the uh, classification of intergovernmental organizations based on their uh, activities. Uh, as I said, they are, uh, there are uh, geographical classification, there are the field classification, uh, I mean, the, based on the goal and activity, field of activity, but uh, which one is more productive and which one is more uh, visible? This is the question. Uh, I think that uh, we, we have to include uh, some, another classification for the for this uh, part, which uh, we can call the sectorial or thematic international organizations, which is very important because uh, sectorial or thematic international organizations, they are more focused on specific, uh, on specific field of uh, development, either uh, economic, economic or social or even political or uh, military. Uh, so in, in that case, uh, I mean, international intergovernmental organizations, uh, they can be uh, classified as, uh, as we said first, global ones and regional ones, and then sub-regional ones, or the global ones we can call universal ones. But at the same time, we can tell uh, economic ones, uh, political ones, uh, cultural ones, uh, and we, we have to include here one uh, classification more, sectorial or thematic. This is uh, 
this is about the nature of that international organization, uh, about its set of goals and rules. So uh, this is my, uh, let's say, finding or proposal about the classification. So there are, uh, we can say that there are umbrella regional, uh, umbrella uh, international organizations, and also there are sectorial uh, international organizations, which can be part or subsidiary uh, or specialized part of that umbrella organization. Uh, because the uh, thematic or sectorial international organizations are more focused on specifics of uh, regional cooperation and development. While umbrella organizations are providing the general uh, framework for all kinds of cooperation, depending on the nature and uh, aims of the organization. And uh, linking the regional cooperation and the international organizations to nowadays, and especially the uh, situation uh, related to this COVID-19 pandemic, uh, I would like to add that this uh, situation and the pandemic situation in the world uh, of course, uh, without doubt, uh, it will bring, or it already may be brought, the new realities uh, to the world in all uh, fields, including the international politics and international uh, cooperation. So, uh, as we know, there are uh, around 1,500 international organizations in total in the world even more than that. So, uh, so today's realities uh, uh, will make us to be more uh, selected uh, on international organizations. So which international organizations are really uh, necessary, which one are not? Because I think that the, after uh, pandemic area, the world community, the international uh, actors, uh, the members, the, the, actually the states, sovereign states, the private sector, they will be more uh, selective on their uh, expenditure of sources, resources actually, because uh, uh, the reality has changed and there are new uh, terms, new conditions. So, uh, and each international organization, if it has the uh, secretariat, permanent secretariat, it, ha it needs some fundings for action. So uh, I think that it will be more uh, selective, the world community, the member states, private sector, they will be more selective uh, towards the international organizations and many international organizations which uh, were inactive uh, until this time, or maybe uh, they were uh, not uh, active uh, in the in current conditions. Uh, in, in future, they may uh, gradually uh, uh, eliminate it, or they may be uh, dissolved. So, uh, as I said, new realities. Uh, in the, uh, the importance of the international organizations and their uh, compliance or compatibility with new realities uh, will define the future and perspective of each international organization. Uh, and I would like uh, to mention that in this uh, stage uh, or in this part of the presentation that uh, so many international organizations, they are trying to fulfill their daily activities online or uh, through uh, different kind of uh, social media channels. Uh, and uh, Organization of Islamic Cooperation also, by the way, uh, just recently held one of its uh, international meetings uh, online. Uh, actually, there, there was a the virtual extraordinary meeting of the OIC steering committee on health, uh, which aimed to discuss uh, the member states' efforts to tackle the challenges uh, sparked by the COVID-19 outbreak. 
uh, and which recommended uh, straining in coordination of efforts to contain the disease. Uh, another important, for example, example, uh, another important uh, example uh, for online meetings uh, recently, just on 10 April, the extraordinary, extraordinary summit of heads of states of Turkic Council uh, was held uh, with the initiative of, uh, of the chair of the summit, His Excellency Ilham Ali, the president of the Republic of Azerbaijan. And in this uh, video summit, extraordinary summit, uh, the member states of the Turkic Council, uh, the Azerbaijan, Kazakhstan, Kyrgyzstan, Turkey, Uzbekistan and Tur Turkmenistan were represented by their president and also presidents and also the Hungary the Prime Minister of Hungary and Director General of World Health Organization also participated in this conference. So uh, gradually we are uh, uh, t t taking the, I mean, uh, we are getting used to live in these new conditions. So many international organizations, no doubt, uh, will continue their activities in this coming weeks or months uh, online. And, uh, but as I said, after the even pandemic era, uh, the, there will be new realities for the international organizations also. So uh, maybe this uh, situation will bring uh, the importance about the uh, health care uh, in international level, many international uh, bodies or uh, let's say entities may uh, maybe more may, be, may, may become more important than uh, other ones uh, the, the ones which are uh, focused on health and I think that uh, this is also a challenge for the OIC organization of Islamic cooperation uh, which uh, I think that uh, has not any subsidiary or specialized institution uh, specifically on health uh issues uh, as far as i understand the general secretariat itself uh undertakes the role of uh following up the health issue related uh, decisions but i think that maybe uh in uh, coming months or uh, post pandemic uh, era uh, the member states of the oic will raise the issue uh, of establishing the specialized or subsidiary body of the OIC, specifically focusing on health issues or health uh, cooperation. Because as uh, we uh, witnessed in, uh, in these conditions, the cooperation of the states are very important. Uh, the collective, uh, let's say, uh, response of the states are very important uh, to fight against this kind of uh, disease. So collective decisions, collective actions, they, these, these are very important. So uh, I think that uh, that's uh, for now all what I wanted uh, to mention. Uh, it took uh, a bit more than 45 minutes. Uh, I am sorry, Shujaid. Uh, now uh, the floor is yours. If there is any question or any uh, opinion, I'll be glad uh, to respond. Thank you, Mr. Mehdiev, for a very fruitful uh, the lecture that you delivered. And you emphasized the importance of the international organizations, their creation and their current situation. There are a lot of questions. I mean, uh, I will ask several of them. Uh, some of them were about the coronavirus pandemic and the role of international organizations, which you already talked. Um, the first question is about how much are these international organizations able to reduce political instability in a country? Do you hear me? Yeah, yeah, I hear you. So the question is about the, how much the international organizations are effective in fighting the political instability in definite country. Yes, yes, yes. Uh, well, it depends on the situation. Uh, international organization and uh, about the specifics of the international organization which we are talking about. Uh, I mean, uh, 
the if it's let's say the uh, universal organization kind of United Nations, uh, we we have the samples of this uh, United Nations. Uh, or even the regional uh, organizations, they uh, issued the numerous resolutions or let's say recommendations about uh, the, actually most, most of them are recommendations about the uh, political situation in a definite country, if there is an instability. So uh, I don't want to name the countries, but uh, there are too many samples of that. But in action, uh, uh, it depends on the political will of the member states. And also, uh, I, I think that there are, uh, each country is unique. Uh, so uh, again, in, in, in the near history, we can, uh, for example, uh, just for instance, uh, the war in Balkans in uh, uh, past Yugoslavia, which now uh, there are uh, I think that five independent states emerged. So uh, during that time, the international community uh, were decisive to intervene and to uh, provide the ceasefire or let's say the political resolution of the situation and uh, to put end to political instability in that uh, region. Uh, in some cases, and of course, the uh, let's say uh, uh, efforts of the uh, states or the those who are do who involved to these issues to this uh, conflict or let's say instability uh, was ineffective. For example, in case of Srebrenica, the huge massacre uh, genocide happened there. But uh, the countries uh, involved that they were not uh, sufficient enough to stop this uh, mass massacre. But in general, at the end of the uh, political instability of war there, uh, somehow there is a new reality, the new independent states. And uh, I think that uh, the involvement of the uh, involvement of the uh, other countries uh, were, uh, was very uh, decisive or let's say was very critical to achieve this uh, st stable political situation there now. Uh, so we can give example about this in uh, different geographies also. But uh, I think that international organizations, uh, you know, uh, one of the let's say uh, rules or let's say one of the kind of features of international organizations is uh, all let's say one of the features of being a sovereign state is non-interference to the uh, internal issues. So if uh, one state becomes the member of the uh, international organization, of course it uh, signs some agreement or uh, the charter of that international organization which means that it uh, accepts these uh, uh, rules, the set of rules, but at the same time, uh, uh, the non-interference into, uh, into the internal political issue, or internal issues, it's a very important factor in international politics. So that's why uh, I think that uh, we don't see much examples of the interference to the internal issues of the states. By the way, even there are now uh, new, uh, let's say, uh, examples where uh, in, uh, in most of the countries, uh, members uh, in most of the sovereign states, sovereign nations, the, uh, the, in the constitution, it says that international law privilege or international law prevails the national law. So when you are part of the, some international treaty or international organization or international law, that law prevails your national law. Uh, in most of the countries, it's like this. In, in constitution, it's uh, openly uh, emphasized. But now, for example, uh, if you see the new uh, amendments or the amendment uh, proposals for the constitution of Russian Federation, which uh, put the national law of Russian Federation 
uh, above the international law. So this is another uh, challenge. Uh, this is another, uh, let's say, reality. So I think that uh, maybe I uh, somehow try to uh, answer yes. to the question. And uh, of course, it's very hard to yes. fully uh, respond. But I think that the uh, question was responded. Thank you very much. The second question was from the Nijat Mamadli. Yes. Um, he is asking about what unites all these nations from wide geography besides religion. And also, in fact, even some member state is not Muslim majority. So what is their reason to be a member of OIC, which you mentioned during your lecture? Uh, I'm very thankful to Mr. Nijat Mamadli for the question. Uh, yes, in the OIC, as I mentioned, there are 57 member states. Even some of the member states, as it was stated in the question, not majority are Muslims. Uh, like in the uh, Latin American states, in, uh, in, uh, uh, in Suriname, for example, or in, uh, in the example of the Uganda uh, from Africa. Just uh, maybe 20% of the population are Muslim, but the Uganda is the member of the OIC. So uh, except religion, what unites these uh, member states, it's very, you know, comprehensive. It needs very comprehensive response. Uh, first of all, I think that uh, the factor which unites these states, uh, it's religious based cultural uh, or historical factor. Uh, even more the religious based cultural factor because uh, as as in the name of the organization it's mentioned it's the organization of islamic cooperation so first it's uh, it's about the muslim states yes there are uh, as we mentioned uh, countries which uh, not majority uh, majority uh, populated by muslims but still these or these states they uh, pretend to take the advantage or the opportunities which this organization brings. So, or maybe due to respect to the uh, religious minority, they become the member states. But this is opportunity for them, another opportunity for them uh, to cooperate internationally and to use the uh, advantages of this international organization. What unites these uh, countries? Uh, first of all, the, all of them, as I said, uh, almost all of them are the Muslim, uh, majority Muslim populated countries. At the same time, the realities, the realities bring them together. Uh, mm -hmm. Economic realities, social realities, cultural realities, and first of all, political realities. If we will, uh, for, for instance, uh, uh, the, most of these countries, uh, they are, uh, let's say, uh, there are, the, that, that fact is enough that none of these uh, OIC member states, they are not uh, developed country or member of G7, for example. Uh, yes, there are the members in G20, but uh, none of these countries are, uh, are considered a developed country. The, the, some portion are developing and some portion even the less developed country. So this economic reality, the politically, uh, none of these uh, member states are member of the United Nations Security Council, which means that none of these states can uh, veto or can influence any decision adopted by the United Nations Security Council. Uh, so uh, this is political reality and we, we know the, very well the political situation in the world. Uh, the culturally, uh, they, these countries, uh, uh, most of them, even almost all of them, they are the countries established or got independence in the 20th century. So this is another reality for them. Uh, and uh, so all together, these factors uh, created the necessity for them to be united in one platform. But of course, we should not forget 
the main triggering uh, factor which brought all of them together, or let's say the founding members together. That was the uh, the issue of Palestine, uh, especially uh, the issue of Al-Aqsa Mosque, which was born uh, barbarically, wonderfully born uh, in 1969 and uh, triggered uh, the conference of the founding members of the Organization of Islamic Cooperation. I think that the OIC is very important international institution. Yes, we can uh, put many uh, let's say examples or many uh, factors that uh, maybe there are shortcomings uh, in the system of the OIC or in actions, but still it's very important international organization for its member states. Uh, it's another uh, opportunity or it's another platform for the member states to come together to discuss their issues the regional, co including their regional cooperation in economic field, in cultural field, in political field, and many others. So as we call it in the OIC, it's the collective voice of Muslim population. But uh, of course, as I said, there can be many shortcomings, but uh, or many challenges, but all of them, I think that uh, can be uh, dealt with and in order uh, to, uh, provide the development of the organization and the efficiency of the organization. Thank you for the question. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think that we can pass to the next question. Thank you, Mr. Mehdiev. Also, I'd like to mention the very supportive the comments from our alumni, also from our board members, Sahatul Hassan, Wajih Haris, Utaba Tariq, that they are supporting us very from the very beginning. Of I'm the very day. thankful. Um, uh, there are a lot of questions about uh, how do you see the role of international organizations, in particular OIC, after the, this pandemic. You talked a lot about that, and there are several questions about that. I would like to uh, conclude them in a one in a one question sentence and ask from you: How do you see the role of this organization after this pandemic? Will it change radically or not really? If you could answer briefly, thank you very much. Oh, well, uh, again, thank you. Uh, thank you for the question. Uh, as I uh, mentioned, the COVID-19 pandemic, uh, you know, this is uh, kind of first time the world is, the modern world is facing such a uh, challenge. So of course it will bring new realities. Uh, of course, we cannot now calculate the or measure the uh, scales of this, uh, let's say, uh, impact. But definitely, uh, one can uh, we, we can say that uh, there will be uh, impact on uh, on the world and uh, international politics, international relations. Uh, on the states, on the communities, on individuals also. Uh, maybe uh, afterwards we'll think uh, a bit different about the world, about our priorities. So uh, one of the uh, one of the results of this pandemic is that, for example, individually maybe we are now and we now understand that uh, we lived in the atmosphere of. Uh, many needs, which is indeed, un which are indeed unnecessary. So uh, now we understand that without that, we also could live. But now uh, maybe there are some uh, some needs we we underestimated or we didn't put much uh, attention. Now we understand that that values or that needs were very important. So, of course, individually, we are also very affected. And uh, the new realities for the international organizations, definitely there will be. And as I mentioned, the efficiency of the international organizations they, and their compatibility with the new realities, that will be very important on the future destiny of the international organizations. Because, as I said again, the pandemic, uh, the pandemic, uh, uh, condition or situation going 
in, uh, in parallel with the economic crisis. The resources, uh, especially the monetary uh, money sources of the states or private sector, uh, it's very, let's say, uh, on the big uh, danger or question. So that's why the uh, states will be more selective in uh, expanding their uh, sources. Uh, and in that case, I think that the fundings of international organizations, that will be limited. And uh, there will be uh, concrete tasks, concrete expectations put in front of these international organizations, in front of these uh, secretariats, headquarters, to produce uh, something or to, to be efficient. And uh, that's why uh, I believe that uh, some, mem some international organizations which exist, but maybe we even don't know their names or we, we know some of them, uh, in coming years, maybe they will uh, just uh, disappear. Uh, or maybe there will, uh, the new international organizations or regional organizations will emerge. That's uh, in these realities. The uh, specifics, the features of that organizations will differ. Uh, first of all, we can say that the field will differ. For example, health organizations, that's very important. Yes, there is a World Health Organization. Maybe they will be questioning how effective is it or uh, how we can make it more effective or how we can uh, enforce the activities of World Health Organization through different uh, sub-regional or regional international organizations. Or, uh, I mean, there can be many uh, possibilities about that. So I think that uh, after uh, pandemic era, uh, definitely the, uh, there will be impacts on international organizations also. And uh, no doubt, uh, the new international organizations or international, let's say, uh, entities will emerge and some uh, existing international entities or organizations will, will just disappear. Yeah, thank you for your question uh, and for your answer, sorry. Um, uh, if you don't mind, I will ask this last question and then we can conclude our live stream. Yeah, of course, thank you. Um, this last question is about the conflicts in OIC region, which the viewers asked a lot about, especially about the Kashmir conflict. Uh, the few after this pandemic, how should OIC deal with these conflicts in the OIC regions? Should engage more, or in the scope of the strengthening national states, what what will be the role of the OIC in the conflict situation, conflict situations? If you could answer, please. Thank you. Thank you for the question. I think that uh, nevertheless, I mean, uh, without even pandemic situation, uh, YC uh, was uh, as much as possible uh, attentive or uh, influential in, uh, in, the, in some conflicts which uh, happened or uh, still continues in the OIC geography. So uh, there are numerous resolutions on Kashmir, and also there are numerous resolutions on uh, occupied uh, Azerbaijani territories, Nagorno-Karabakh and sur surrounding territories. Uh, this is the maximum what in the OIC capacity the OIC can do, because as organization, uh, the maximum thing, uh, in the, uh, I mean, almost maximum, let's say, but, but of course there are some other, uh, uh, some other levels also. So as organization, uh, OIC uh, express its solidarity with the Rep Islamic Republic of Pakistan on the Kashmir issue, the people of the Kashmir, Jammu and Kashmir. And, uh, but you know, uh, it, Again, it depends on the efficiency of the organization or how serious it is. For example, if uh, I don't want just to give the name of the conflict or member state, or uh, but imagine that uh, on specific uh, conflict, the organization can, may adopt the resolution where they 
uh, all kind of uh, economic or uh, let's say uh, cultural, social, political relations of its member states with occupant state is uh, prohibited or uh, let's say uh, not welcome. So, and member states may obey to this resolution and that will be very effective by the way. But uh, again, it depends on the efficiency of the uh, organization and also if the member states are ready to adopt such a resolution. How, uh, uh, how uh, not sincere, but how decisive they are in their this expression. So not just to adopt the resolution condemning, but some action needed uh, resolutions. That's very important moment. But you know, uh, I think that uh, the pandemic uh, crisis, uh, situation or conditions in the world, not directly. I mean, uh, to be frank, I don't see the direct connection or interconnection between the conflicts and uh, attitude of the international organizations to these conflicts or uh, uh, crisis and uh, the pandemic, uh, COVID-19 pandemic. But uh, again, uh, indirectly, may, it may uh, affect uh, the position of international organizations. What I mean is that, uh, again, uh, the member states will, will become more selective uh, in becoming the members of some certain international organizations. And uh, they will truly uh, seek if that member orga international organization uh, uh, meets all the requirements or all the uh, needs of these member states. So in that case, maybe indirectly they can affect somehow, but direct connection between these two factors, I don't see uh, to be frank. Thank you very much for answering the questions. And thank you for a very productive and a fruitful lecture. It was very useful, especially for me as well. And I hope that it was same for the participants. And uh, in the next days we will have the productive lectures as we have today. If you had any closing remarks, I'd like to give you floor to you. If you don't, we can just conclude. Well, thank you. Once again, I would like to thank all the participants who joined this live session and I call all of them to be more active in coming lectures because as you mentioned in the beginning, uh, the activity of the uh, participants, we, based on that activity, the Eurasian Regional Center of ICYF will invite the participants to its uh, model of IC simulations. So, uh, by the way, uh, this is one of the unique platforms, uh, our this uh, model of IC courses, uh, where the ambassadors are invited. So uh, we run in parallel two projects uh, related with model OIC. One is the international one, executive model OIC lectures, which we are started to we started today, and tomorrow we are starting the uh, in the national level in Azerbaijan, which will be in uh, Azerbaijan. Uh, and uh, on 15 April, uh, we'll have as a guest the ambassador of the state of Palestine to Azerbaijan, who will address you with his uh, lecture. And uh, I'll invite all the listeners, all the participants of this live session to follow our page, ERC page, and to be uh, to get the information from there uh, about the time of the lecture. It will be announced in the page and to participate in coming lectures also. Again, thank you very much. Thank you, everybody. Uh, and thank you, Shujaat, for your uh, time and for your uh, the role of, let's say, uh, anchor of this uh, session. Thank you very much. Thank you for joining us. And thank you for all participants for joining us today. As Mr. Mehdi have said, there will be more opportunities for you. Stay tuned. Uh, keep informed about the, this news. And thank you. thanks again for joining. If you and of course, uh, stay tuned, stay at home, stay safe. Uh, so <laughs> everything related with the state. Yes, yes. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye.